The anhydride, or acid anhydride, consists of two carbonyl groups flanking a central oxygen, and both of the carbonyl carbons within an anhydride have the potential to act as electrophiles because the remainder of the molecule, the part that would break off in a nucleophilic acyl substitution reaction, is a carboxylate. And while carboxylate doesn't really fit our definition of a great leaving group, it's certainly not as great as chloride, it's good enough to participate in nucleophilic acyl substitution reactions with strong enough nucleophiles, provided we're going thermodynamically downhill in replacing the carboxyl group with the nucleophile, this will work. What this means in practice is that we can start with an anhydride. And to keep things simple, I'm just going to think about this as a symmetric anhydride with both R groups the same. Things get weird if the anhydride is not symmetric, right, because we have a question of which carbonyl group gets attacked if these are not identical. So let's just think about a symmetric anhydride for the time being. And the punchline is we can get from the anhydride to an ester product, and this involves treatment with an alcohol, as we'll see in a second, or an amide. We can't get up to an acid chloride because the acid chloride is more reactive than an anhydride. This would be thermodynamically uphill. But if we treat, for example, an anhydride with an alcohol, the product that we end up with is an ester, where the H in ROH in the alcohol has been replaced with an acyl group. So this corresponds to acylation of an alcohol with an anhydride. And this can be done with the neutral alcohol or with an alkoxide if stronger conditions are desired or a faster reaction is desired. Treatment of an anhydride with a primary or secondary amine gives an amide. And here, keep in mind that we need the amine to be primary or secondary so that we can deprotonate the nitrogen at some point in the mechanism to give a neutral amide. And here again, we see carboxylate acting as a leaving group ultimately in this. The nucleophilic nitrogen is replacing this carboxylate fragment. And so the byproduct of both of these reactions is the carboxylate or the carboxylic acid corresponding to the remainder of the anhydride. And I would encourage you to check and make sure that these chemical equations are balanced, that all of the atoms on the reactant side are accounted for in the products. Just like in the alcohol case, if stronger reactivity is desired, it's possible to use an amide base here, although this may be a bit of overkill as NR2- is extremely reactive. When we get to the esters, we're far enough down on the reactivity ladder that it's difficult to convert esters into other carboxylic acid derivatives. Pretty much the only thing we can do is treat an ester with a primary or secondary amine to afford amides. This is about the only functional group interchange reaction we can do. So for example, say we started with a generic ester, the ester's leaving group is OR, an alkoxy or alcohol leaving group. And so we can treat with a nucleophile stronger than an alcohol something like a primary or secondary amine, and we should expect this to form an amide spontaneously since the amine nucleophile on the reactant side is more reactive than the alcohol nucleophile we generated on the product side via cleavage of the CO bond toward oxygen. This converts the ester into an amide, and this is moving down that reactivity ladder. The other thing we can do, which is worth mentioning here, is transesterification, turning one ester into another. If we imagine, for example, taking an ester and treating it with an alcohol whose R group does not match the alkoxy group in the original ester, so R1 in the ester and R2 in the alcohol, it's possible at least to imagine a substitution process taking place through nucleophilic acyl substitution generating the other possible ester with R2, OR2 really, replacing OR1. This would also give the alcohol of R1 as a byproduct. And we can certainly write this down. Of course, if we think about the thermodynamics, HOR1 is, in general, not especially stable relative to HOR2. They're both alcohols, right? And so in order to drive this process forward, typically what we have to do is use a large excess of the alcohol that we want to be installed in, into the ester. This drives the reaction forward through a Le Chatelier's principle type effect. We're using an excess of a reactant and that pushes the reaction toward products. The other thing we'll do to accelerate this process is to use acid or base catalysis. And that can actually be done with many of these nucleophilic acyl substitutions. We've seen the mechanistic underpinnings of this in a previous video. The inclusion of a little bit of strong acid, so H3O plus 
or a little bit of base, OH minus, is going to accelerate this process dramatically. There is one step down the reactivity ladder that we haven't talked about yet, and that's the conversion of an ester into a carboxylate or a carboxylic acid. And this too should be spontaneous, and it corresponds to the use of water as a nucleophile rather than an alcohol, simply replacing the R group of an alcohol with H. And this leads to hydrolysis because the CO bond breaks and is replaced with an OH group. We get to a carboxylic acid. So an overall reaction scheme might look something like this. The ester reacts with water to form a carboxylic acid. And the alcohol in which the alkoxy group of the original ester is now in an alcohol molecule. Really though, just like the transesterification reaction, we should expect this to be a reversible process since OH and OR are not that different. Neither side of this equilibrium is particularly stable, and so we should expect maybe a 50-50 mixture of products or so in a general case. To circumvent this, we do the same thing that we did in the transesterification case and use an excess of water. This isn't hard to do considering the abundance of water, right? And so doing the reaction, for example, in solvent water, placing an ester in solvent water, tends to drive it toward the hydrolyzed products, the carboxylic acid and alcohol. We'll use acid or base to accelerate this process, and when acid is used, we can run the reaction under catalytic conditions with a substoichiometric or a catalytic amount of H3O+, and this just makes the achievement of equilibrium faster, makes the reaction faster. And this is really just a catalyzed nucleophilic acyl substitution mechanism, protonating the carbonyl oxygen, nucleophilic attack, some proton transfer shuffling to get a proton on the leaving group, and departure of the alcohol through beta elimination generates the neutral carboxylic acid product and regenerates the catalyst after proton transfer. So that's a very succinct description of the mechanism of this reaction, but I would encourage you to draw it out on your own. Naturally, we may think, well, the use of a base then in catalytic amounts should also work. However, basic hydrolysis is not catalytic. And the reasons why become clear when we think through this reaction. So let's say we started with an ester and we treated the ester with aqueous base. The strongest nucleophile in a solution of aqueous base is hydroxide. And if we imagine a simple addition elimination mechanism involving hydroxide adding to the carbonyl carbon and kicking off OR minus, where we would end up is here. But in order to make this process catalytic, we have to somehow regenerate the hydroxide. And it's not entirely clear how this is going to happen. In fact, as soon as we've made a carboxylic acid molecule, any remaining hydroxide is going to deprotonate this spontaneously and form a carboxylate. And that's going to be irreversible. That's heavily favored because of the acidity of carboxylic acids. PKA of 15 for the conjugate acid of hydroxide pKa of 5 for a carboxylic acid. So that is a heavily favored acid-base reaction. That's why we can't use catalytic base for ester hydrolysis, because the carboxylic acid product that would be generated reacts rapidly with the catalyst and consumes it. That said, we can still use base to accomplish hydrolysis. It's just that we need to use a stoichiometric amount of it, a full equivalent of it, rather than a substoichiometric or catalytic amount. So for example, we might use one full equivalent or one to one mole ratio of some hydroxide base in solution with an ester. And this leads irreversibly to the production of a carboxylate anion. That's really the key. This anion is stabilized relative to the hydroxide anion. So this process is heavily favored and irreversible as well as the alcohol involving the alkoxy group in the starting ester. You'll hear this basic hydrolysis reaction of esters referred to as saponification. The sap part of the name refers to soap. This reaction was used to make soap back in the day, and probably still is, from esters. The fatty acid carboxylates generated when a very long chain ester is hydrolyzed in base are used for soap.